Great. Awesome. Okay. So Yay. welcome everyone to our emerging artist panel. So this panel will be showcasing emerging performers, playwrights, and theater administrators in the Montreal performance art community. And today we will be discussing the different hurdles experienced by early career creatives and how they persevered and adapted over the ever-changing landscape of the pandemic. This panel is part of Youth Theater's Developing Youth Share program, which aims to empower the local creative community by bringing together artists to learn, share, and explore. So today's panel will be hosted by myself. I am Hannah Ness, um, she, her, and I am the outreach uh, coordinator at Youth Theater in Montreal. Virginie? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, bonjour tout le monde. Je vais juste euh, résumer brièvement aussi en français ce que Hannah vient nous expliquer. Donc, euh, vous assistez à une table ronde organisée par le Youth Theatre euh, ayant pour sujet la relève en temps de pandémie afin de parler des différents défis puis euh, des, euh, des, de, des perspectives pour les artistes qui se trouvent dans la relève en ce moment dans le milieu théâtral dans divers rôles, euh, divers statuts dans cette période assez particulière. Euh, ça fait partie du programme You Share du Youth Theatre. Je vais co-animer avec Hannah et moi, c'est donc Virginie. Je suis stagiaire au développement au Youth Theatre. Um, Hannah, I'll give it back to you. All right, so I think we're just going to go around the circle here and everyone can introduce themselves. And in your introduction, please tell us your name, your artistic practice and where you trained and your dream miscast role. So I'm gonna hand it off to Anna. Okay, um, I'm like still in the question, but uh, my name's Anna. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I am an actor, an artist. Um, I trained at the National Theatre School of Canada. I graduated last June um, and my dream miscast role. I feel like the first thing that comes to mind is like Miss Hannigan from Annie. You know, <laughs> like I would never be cast as that. It would definitely cast me as like the little boy character. But um, yeah, that's that's my that's my miscast character, and I will pass it on to Espoir. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Espoir Segbeaya. I am from Nelson, British Columbia, but I trained here in Montreal at the National Theatre School. And I graduated in 2020 or 2021, technically, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> I graduated into the pandemic. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and um, Sweeney Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass it on to Julie. Hi, my name is Julie Fon Pungaman. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm currently completing my third year at the National Theatre School in playwriting. Um, I'll, yeah, I'm from Toronto. Uh, most of my work is there, but I'm also based here. Uh, most of my work in writing, uh, performance and pole dances in Toronto. And I'm uh, sort of doing interim uh, theater administration at Tissery Dunya Theater. Um, and I I don't know why, but like the first thought of like dream miscast role is like Batman. Um, <laughs> I don't know, just like, just like watching Robert Pattinson. I was just like, oh man, I can do anything. <laughs> It'd be so fun, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll pass it on to Jake. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jake. My pronouns are he, him. I'm from Montreal and I graduated in 2020 from the theater program at Dawson College. Uh, since then I've been an actor, a theater teacher for children, theater administrator. Um, and I think my dream miscast role would be the Mrs. Lovett to Espoir's Sweeney Todd. I think oh. I should definitely see how <laughs> after and uh, work that out. Um, yeah. I'll pass it to Brice. Hello, hello. Uh, donc moi, c'est Brice Gouguet. Je suis français d'origine vietnamienne. 
j'ai immigré en 2017 ici à Montréal euh, et j'ai gradué à l'école supérieure de théâtre de Lucam euh, l'année dernière, en mai. Euh, donc, je suis actuellement acteur et également euh, adjoint de production à la coop vidéo. Et euh, mon casting de rêve, c'est dur à dire. En théâtre, je serais comme à peu près n'importe quoi venant de Victor Hugo, peut-être Don Alphonse dans Lucrèce Borgia. Et euh, en cinéma, dernièrement, j'ai une fascination totale pour... Bah, J'avais déjà une fascination pour Anthony Hopkins, mais dans The Father... Euh, j'ai été extrêmement touché. Serait... J'ai encore le temps d'être une vieille âme et de devenir peut-être comme ça. Mais euh, voilà, c'est pas mal ça. Wow, super. I think I'd love to see any of those casting happen one day. Anything, anything is possible. So we can dream. So I'll start with our first question and then I'll um, switch it to French so we can get all kinds of perspective. But this one is kind of for every, anyone who wants to jump in. So um, how has it been graduating slash finishing up, departing your studies into the arts industry during the pandemic? I can go. Um, it's been really weird and really interesting, but in hindsight, when I look back at everything since 2020 and how like all of my goals and things changed, um, the primary feeling, this is really weird, but the primary feeling that I get is like relief. Um, I am someone who takes a lot of time to process things slowly and And just jumping into my career after school is actually something that I wouldn't have been able to do. I would have been overwhelmed. I would have burnt out. I would have, um, and, and really, you know, at NTS specifically, uh, we do so much work with uh, artists from Ontario and, and there's such a kind of underspoken um, push to us to go to Toronto to do work because that's where uh, things are happening in Canada. Uh, supposedly, at, in, in, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. And I, I really wasn't ready to make that decision. And I think that if I were to talk to any student out, 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 right out of the gates, I think taking that time consciously, it, to me, it was imposed upon me, but taking that time consciously, like, really prepared, gave me time to meet people, gave me time to email people, gave me time to just watch shows, whether they were virtual or audio or whatever, like gave me time to just kind of see what I liked and then go, oh, that's what I want to do. I think without that time, I wouldn't have been able to. So, yeah, but it was hard. It was depressing. It was, it was messy. I've never been this broke in my life. Like it, like when, when, when the only other thing I'm good at besides performing is like working in a kitchen and then kitchens are closing every two months it, it, it's like nothing in the world I could do was being offered to me and, and so that was hard but um yeah yeah if I can just hop off that as well like I think um similar to what Aspar was saying it's been extremely hard for everybody I think it would have been an even bigger shock to have finished school kept going, sort of established a career for myself and then get put into the pandemic. Um, I think like we were in different positions where I was in the school for, or was in school for a bit of the pandemic. And so I got used to it to a certain extent. Um, it also meant that I lost a lot of opportunities that I had really looked forward to at, at my training program but it did prepare me at least for graduating and yeah just taking my time with things as opposed to expecting I think my expectations would have been a lot higher had there not been a worldwide catastrophe um, and I'm not so sure the field is set up to support a lot of emerging artists anyways regardless of the pandemic so yeah Yeah, like managing expectations was a really tricky thing. It was very confusing because 
even before there was a pandemic, I kind of had been predicting like, okay, you know, we're going to graduate and it's going to be slow and it's going to be tricky the first couple of years. And then the pandemic hit and I never quite knew if the moments where I wasn't, nothing was going on for me. I was like, am I just bad or is there a pandemic? Like I never knew uh, if it was me or not, you know, and it felt like such a cop out to just be like, well, well, there's a pandemic, no one's working because that issue is like, that makes, that takes responsibility off of me. Right. So finding that balance of like, I can be validated on myself, but I still have to look for opportunities. Like that was um, a weird needle of thread. J'ai l'impression en fait que ça, justement, bah, comme, comme Jack le disait, ça brouille un petit peu. C'est difficile de savoir si, les, euh, si le, le manque d'opportunités vient de nous ou si, euh, si c'est à cause de la pandémie. Puis, euh, en fait, pour nous, en tout cas, euh, je, je, je parle avec Virginie puisqu'on est gradué de la même école. Euh, notre graduation a été assez circonstancielle puisqu'on est la seule école à avoir eu des restrictions vis-à-vis -vis de la COVID. Donc, on n'a pu inviter personne, on n'a pas pu avoir de diffusion particulière. Et ça fait que, à part les quatre sous qui, honnêtement, je pense, tiennent plus de la tradition que du, 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 réel, du réel rayonnement euh, attendu, c'est difficile de savoir, en fait, finalement, si, euh, si à cause de la pandémie, on a juste manqué des opportunités ou si, euh, si c'est peu importe, en fait, c'est l'école et, et la manière dont ça s'est organisé qui, euh, qui a fait ça. Donc, ouais, c'est un petit peu compliqué. Puis, je pense qu'on, ben, en tout cas, moi, de mon côté, je me suis senti un petit peu abandonné là, à la fin de l'école. C'était un, euh, un petit peu confrontant. Puis, c'est difficile de trouver des ressources euh, une, fois, euh, une fois le diplôme euh, obtenu, quoi. Uh, I think I've been really lucky in that, like, I've been able to receive grants to continue doing the work that I'm doing uh, outside of school. And that's not always encouraged or supported when I, I really think it should be. Like, grant writing is a skill that should be taught more so that people can create their own opportunities for themselves. And unfortunately, like, that isn't something that is normally done, and but that I feel like really um, should be. Because uh, I found it really helpful um, during my time just to be able to like receive a little bit of money to be able to like create my own things, but also be able to like form relationships outside of school as well. Because like I think um, that like especially like with NTS people, like we know that like it's a very like insular sort of um, culture that um, because of like how insular it is, like you don't really know what it is like out there until you're actually um doing it um so like yeah like i encourage people who are in like pandemic in school to sort of like try to form relationships outside of school because and also like because people are at home or or like companies are doing work from home as well like i think they have a bit more of a capacity to be able to um to to reach these like people and set up meetings over like zoom has been a really helpful tool that's come out of the pandemic um to yeah create opportunities i mean you guys bring up a bunch of amazing points about opportunities be that either finding the few that are showing up and or creating your own so for the ones that did arise what were they like for you and were they happening throughout the pandemic or were you kind of really seeing these opportunities arise near the end or, you know, in the past year or so where we've had a bit more um, leverage, uh, a bit more kind of freedom happening with the amount of performance opportunities that can, that can go up in the city? Yeah, like pretty much every, any opportunity that I've had or been given during the pandemic has been because there was a company or like a person in the city that has had a vested interest in supporting emerging artists and like has made it their business to be like, who is graduating right now and how can I support them? Which I think is a really lovely thing that might be unique to our like smaller art city. Um, yeah, so like stuff like um, the the Tableau Dotes 20, Grad 2020 showcase for the Grad 2020 that didn't get a showcase or the, the QDF Discovery series and like stuff like that. Um, those allowed me to do like what you were saying, Julie, where it was like, we have to make connections on Zoom, which is like an impossible thing. But those kinds of opportunities were the things that kind of were the springboard that led to other stuff because I was actually able to like get my work out and meet people in the city. 
Yeah, I would say a lot more theater. Um, like I audition the most for film, obviously, but the only opportunities that I've been given have, or the only things that have gone through have been theater and they've usually been um, people that I've been in communication with for a while. So that was something that was really affirming was that I, at least in this city, the small and it's small enough of a community that the feelers that I was putting out and the people that I was meeting and like it, it, it feels like you're casting a really wide net at first, but eventually it does sort of seed things for you. Um, but it, yeah, just reinforces that like a lot of the opportunities I'm getting are from knowing people and from connecting as opposed to my demos, my resume, my headshot. That's not really doing anything. Um, it ends up being more fulfilling that way, but also harder to keep going. Like it's not as often. Je ne sais pas, Brice, si tu voulais parler un petit peu aussi, ben, toi et moi, peut-être qu'on peut, qu peut en toucher un mot, mais des, il y a quand même des opportunités ou du moins un peu comme Jake décrivait, des, des compagnies ou des gens qui se sont dit, OK, oui, on va essayer de, de se donner pour mandat, d'avoir un objectif relève, tu sais, un volet relève, puis euh, comment les encadrer. C'était difficile parce que ça se produit justement dans, dans une année, on ne sait jamais quelle restriction il va avoir, c'est de mentionner les quatre sous. Euh, voilà. En ce moment, et toi et moi, on fait le, le programme euh, Nouvelle Garde, qui est très intéressant. Puis il y avait aussi, euh, l'été passé, je pense qu'il y a eu des événements de réseautage, nous aussi, ou des, euh, des opportunités d'échange. Je voulais savoir, toi. Euh... Oui, avec le théâtre tout terrain, en fait, on avait eu l'occasion de faire une audition. Euh, à l'heure actuelle, je pense que c'est la seule opportunité en termes de théâtre qui, euh, qui nous a été proposée. Euh, le, le reste, ben, par exemple, là pour Nouvelle Garde, euh, c'est une super initiative. Euh, ça date d'avant la pandémie, je le précise quand même, hein, parce que euh, c'est sûr que la pandémie est un énorme paramètre, mais euh, euh, le, Nouvelle Garde, ça existe depuis 2018, hein, si je ne me trompe pas. Euh, donc voilà. Donc c'était quand même euh, relativement présent. Après, je pense que c'est assez difficile d'avoir euh, connaissance de ça. Si on n'avait pas eu le bon prof, enfin en, en l'occurrence le, bon, le bon UPE pour nous dire « Hey, je travaille dans ce domaine-là, voici les opportunités ». Et c'est le même UPE finalement qui nous a également dirigé vers l'audition du théâtre tout terrain. C'est sûr que c'est compliqué. Et euh, ce que j'observe en tout cas en ayant gradué de, de l'UCAM, c'est que les opportunités sont vraiment très rares et contingentées en théâtre. C'est beaucoup plus du copinage, c'est beaucoup plus les gens qui travaillent entre eux. Et moi, par exemple, euh, ayant été dans, dans l'autre production, nos productions sont divisées en deux, j'ai senti qu'il y avait, euh, sans dire une scission, je pense qu'on n'a pas eu les mêmes opportunités puisqu'on n'a pas eu les mêmes façons de collaborer. Et donc, moins d'opportunités de travailler ensemble et d'éventuellement créer des choses pour l'avenir. Donc, je pense que c'est euh, quand même un paramètre important à savoir. Et finalement, moi, mes, mes opportunités, euh, ironiquement, les seules que j'ai eues, ça a été en cinéma et ça a été uniquement pour des courts-métrages indépendants. Donc, c'est sûr que quand on gradue de l'école, on se fait beaucoup dire que ça commence comme ça, ça commence par des petites choses, tout ça. Euh... Après, je, je, je trouve ça un peu dommage qu'on ait aussi peu accès à ce rayonnement. Et je pense qu'en même temps, la pandémie a, nous a un petit peu euh, handicapés là-dessus par rapport au, euh, euh, ben, au cas de sous. Je ne pense pas me tromper en disant qu'il y a quand même très peu d'agents qui ont réellement regardé tous les cas de sous. On avait deux, deux, euh, cohortes, euh, deux années de cohortes qui, euh, qui graduaient ensemble. Donc, ça faisait combien Ça faisait 200 candidats au moins, je pense. Donc, c'est sûr que c'est... Ça me paraissait assez irréaliste, puis finalement, mes opportunités, j'ai l'impression que je dois les créer moi-même. Et euh, étant français, ben, je ne peux pas les créer moi-même parce que je suis immigré. Donc, c'est le, le problème aussi, c'est comment tu crées ça, comment tu trouves les bons biais. Est-ce que même en étant immigré, est-ce que tu peux juste trouver la bonne compagnie à qui parler Voilà, c'est tout un tas d'expositions, de, 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 en fait, qui devient vraiment difficile à, à gérer, je pense. I mean, that's a really great point. And I, I think that also kind of leads into um, the opportunities that you did have to create for yourself. What did those look like? Because Julie's touched upon um, really kind of diving into grant writing and exploring that, that avenue. 
what were you guys then doing kind of to, you know, take the place of these opportunities that weren't coming to you from other companies? Um, the, when the pandemic first hit and then kind of, I, I, I was very fortunate. I, I only had like a month and a half of school into the pandemic. And then I was just released into <laughs> the city. And um, it felt so, that bubble that Julie was talking about, I think any student feels that bubble, like it doesn't matter if you're do, even doing an art, like when you leave, you're gonna realize that the world is very real and you've been in a very concentrated thing. And so I had no idea what to do. And at that time we were still, um, we were still wiping, we were still washing our veggies with soap and like, we were still like the toilet paper was still out and there was still like cops like kicking people out of parks and like it was still weird, weird, weird. And it was also Black Lives Matter summer and there was so much protesting and so many contradicting energies going on and like the world really felt like enough. And I realized I hadn't read in a very long time. And when I did read, it was only plays. I had just been reading plays for the last three years. So I was like, I kind of want to read a book. And I got a bit into it and I was like, oh, like, let me get a mic and um, stuff. And I got really lucky into doing a uh, narration of books for um, a project in BC where I'm from though, which is why I was able to work, but narration or narrating books that are only accessible to the visually impaired in Canada, like anyone with a library card. So they were getting people of color and um, different visible minorities to, to, to read respective books by these authors. And like, they, it was such a blessing. Like, I think what, what Jake was saying about people looking out like it like nothing really happens under this um kind of administrative bureau type nothing really happens it's really personal connections and it's really people wanting to do something for a very specific reason and and seeking out the resources to make that happen and not compromising until they they do. And, and so when I was reading these books, I, I really just got to spend time in my house and, and there would, I would read at night because that's when it was quietest and I would kind of sleep all day. And it was a very hazy summer, but that's what first gave me the agency to like actually start reaching out to others. And then I had content for a demo and then I had blah, 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 blah. And this was all before I even got an agent. I had about a year and a half, no agent before, um, anything and I needed that time to to kind of tap into my interests see what's out there for me and then do whatever it, it it took to make it happen and that's not without help and that's not without like guiding hands on at all but yeah mm -hmm. oh I also did the artist mentorship program at Black Theater Workshop and that was all that was always my plan after NTS to do that before moving out, I wanted to just meet people here. So that was one of my biggest leaps. So if anyone listening out here is considering that program, I'd be happy to talk uh, to you about it. You can just reach out. All right. Anyone else has like opportunities that they decided to, or passion projects or like whatever shape they may take um, that they created for themselves, maybe when institutions did not perhaps have the, the, the place or time to sustain them? Um, so I started doing the Paprika Playwrights Unit in my first year at school, uh, which was really helpful because it, I, I think I just really needed something outside of school to work on. And this was like right before the pandemic hit too, but it was already sort of like re happening remote because I was doing everything from Montreal. So they did sort of have things like set up there um, in order for it to like, but when the pandemic like did hit, it transitioned from stage reading to just like um, um, audio theater um, thing, uh, which is also, um, also something that I'm like interested in as well. Like, I think it's like 
what the space and time has sort of allowed is like um, just more room for um, experimentation. Um, something that I'm starting to be like interested into, like with the uh, second, with my second year project, like with school, I wrote a play uh, that I'm now sort of exploring, um, starting to explore like puppetry and WWE. So like making these like Barbie puppets like fight each other, um, which I like, I don't know, like it's just um, happened, but um, because I, um, this play went on to win an award with Major Matt Mason Collective out in, in Calgary. And I'm working with uh, Jenna Rogers, who is uh, also based in like Calgary. Like the, the company and the dramaturge are like out there. I am here and trying to figure out like how to do that. Um, it's been helpful to like have these tools um, to be able to figure that out. But at the same time, like I am glad things are opening up uh, somewhat to all, because I, I think there is a line between like how much can be explored um, over the digital space, but a lot of it, um, I, I think like the core of theater is still like in, in sharing space um, with people and like, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been really drawn to just yeah, creating more opportunities that I'm seeing happen in Toronto, in Montreal, frankly, and like just trying to get a bunch of people that I know together who are passionate and like, yeah, see what's happening in other thriving industries and just bring it here. Um, saying it is a lot more simple than it actually is because it requires money um but that I think has given me uh, some like yeah some spark and some inspiration to create and collaborate on my like independently of a of a body like a school or a theater company so that yeah that I've been really interested in and then also um I felt a lot was lost from my training experience, whether that was because of the pandemic or just because of this, you know, the experience that I had. I've also been really interested in finding other ways, again, like Julie was saying, of just further extending my skills, putting myself in a position where I, I have to get things done is really helpful because it feels like school, but it's not. And um, yeah, just committing myself to like a constant learning and growing. Otherwise you can fall on focusing way too much on what you're not getting and what you're not included in. So that's been really helpful. I was always told like in school, or I feel like the messaging was always like, when you graduate, you're gonna have to create your own work because people aren't gonna just offer you jobs. And that always like terrified me because I was like, I studied acting. Like, I don't know how to write a web series. Like, I don't know how to do any of this. Um, but for me, I, I found that like what that ended up looking like for me was just being proactive about finding opportunities that were already out there. So like really being a joiner and just saying, not being precious about what I say yes to. So like, like I saw on Facebook, like they're auditioning for a fringe show. I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll do the audition. I don't actually know if I can do, but like, you know, just it's a chance to be productive for a day and and, and prepare this thing or, or like taking an FOH job or a theater administration job, even though it's not necessarily maybe the work you want to be doing for the rest of your life. Like I've met so many awesome people that ended up, have ended up being collaborators from, from stuff like that. So um, that's what I would, I, I guess that's what I would offer to people just graduating theater school is just to like say yes to stuff. Even if it's not your dream stuff, like say yes to it, you know? If I can just add a, a comment onto Jake too, like, we're told that so much in school, but kind of what Julie was saying, we're not really given a lot of that support at all. Like grant writing is not something, it's some, it, it was like a 30 minute presentation that we had that the students had to bring forward and ask for. Um, it's sort of like, I don't know if anybody else felt this, but when we were told, oh yeah, when you graduate school, you're gonna have to make work because no one's gonna give you work was sort of this 
sort of this pessimistic view on like the industry and it was almost like a like not a threat but a like oh it's going to be so hard because no one's going to give you work and you're not going to make any money and you're going to have to make your own work and that's going to be really hard that was the sort of tinge that the the sentiment had on it and it wasn't like as giving and fruitful as I've come to understand it was so overbearing and terrifying when I graduated school and then it made it even harder facing rejection because I was like well now I I have no other choice but I have to make all my own work and it's like that is actually a really fruitful opportunity and not it yeah like it, it should be encouraged more than used as a sort of like threat <rire> j'ai l'impression qu'en en art en fait on a comme une espèce de tendance super masochiste à, à se taper dans le dos à genre vraiment euh, acculer un petit peu les étudiants pour leur faire comprendre que c'est la vie ça va être dur puis c'est comme ça c'est l'armée quoi c'est euh, on a un collègue qui serait très d'accord je pense euh, <rire> avec ça avec Virginie mais euh, Ouais, c'est ça. De, de mon côté, euh, je pense que mes, mes opportunités sont un peu mortes dans le... Enfin, pas mortes dans l'œuf, mais je pense qu'elles sont dans un suspens qui va être excessivement long, euh, moins pour des causes de pandémie puis d'émergence, mais pour des causes d'immigration, de, en fait. J'ai énormément écrit pendant, euh, pendant, bah, pendant l'école. J'ai deux pièces euh, en cours de route, puis là, j'ai un balado que je suis en train de terminer. Mais le problème est toujours le est toujours le même, c'est que tant que je ne suis pas résident permanent ou citoyen, je ne peux pas faire de demande, je ne peux pas créer de choses. Et moi, je suis très willing de créer des choses. <rire> Donnez-moi l'opportunité de le faire et je le fais. Euh, c'est juste ça, en fait. C'est essentiellement un problème de, de diffusion puis d'offres qu'on peut donner euh, euh, ben, à l'immigration, à la diversité. Puis, puis en plus, je, je tombe un peu dans une craque puisque je suis immigré, mais également blanc. Et, euh, et euh, quand on est euh, en plus euh, fran français, c'est plus compliqué euh, pour le jeu caméra. Donc, euh, ouais, c'est ça. Je me suis retrouvé un petit peu à, à devoir trouver mes opportunités plus euh, en faisant un petit peu comme Jake, euh, en, en trouvant mes opportunités euh, euh, à auditionner dès que je peux, dès que ça, dès que ça semble me ressembler. Puis bon, jusqu'ici, je pense que je vais quand même réussir à accumuler du, ma du matériel. Ça, c'est relativement positif. Le, le problème étant que ben, c'est pas subventionné. Puis il y a un moment où il faut vivre sa vie quand même. Donc euh, ouais, c'est pas mal, euh, c'est pas mal ça quoi. I had a thing on self-producing to just like go off of um, Anna, and it's that like because it's a thing that's like repeated over and over again of like self-producing it's like I don't know whether it's like because it is terrifying if it's like framed as like hard or if it's like framed as like easy but like that shit's not easy um and uh like I don't know why there isn't more uh like resources devoted because it it is doable Uh, I produced my first show when I was like 17 uh, at the Toronto Fringe uh, and that shit was hard like it but doable like it happened so but it shouldn't be that hard or like I, I was really fortunate that I had mentors I had Marjorie Chan who was um, you know, like given to me as a resource to help me sort of like organize um, and like kind of reassure me that I was like doing everything that I like needed to do. But like, I think there is a way to make this type of learning more accessible so that people aren't like breaking their backs or their like mental health <laughs> trying to um, do this thing that apparently, or like they frame as like, everyone needs to do it, right? Like, why don't you just help us make it, make our lives a little bit easier? Um, that's just something that I wish for, like, ah, the future of, of theater education. Yeah, it seems like there's going to have to be a big overhaul of how these institutions really structure themselves and what they choose to deem what is worthy of being taught, especially because, oh my God, you guys have crazy schedules. Like, I went to McGill. I was a, a Bachelor of Arts person, and meeting people who are in theater school, I was like, oh my God, you're in, you're in school like six days a week. 
do you have a weekend? And they're like, oh, I have to like do tech at 10 p.m. on a Saturday. Oh my God, ridiculous. Um, anyway. <laughs> it's just, if I can yeah, bounce off just what you just said and kind of what everybody just said, because I am also like in the midst of like producing my first show. And like you said, Julie, like it's, it's doable. It's not that it's, it's, um, I got at the intersection of like some, like um, a lot of luck so that I was able to like be afforded the opportunities to then do all of that work, um, mostly, mostly by myself and with the rest of my team, but it shouldn't be so hard that it keeps you from creating opportunities afterwards. Um, Cause I do feel like we're Not, even thinking about them. Like yeah. I just, I just used to stop my brain from even going there. Cause I thought creating your own work meant I had to write a play. And I was like, I'm not a writer like, you know? And so, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. It's just like, and to keep, I feel like, like keeping space alive and like, we can't just do this is not a world where we're we can do just one thing at a time you should be able to work on like various projects without being overwhelmed and not being completely burnt out at the end of one pr project and I was just going to say I do wish that institutions um I think it's starting to be there but it there that there's more tools to prevent burnout instead of somehow glorifying it it's like a thin line you know oui, puis ça rejoint beaucoup euh, le fait que l'art, c'est en fait finalement pour les riches, tu sais, c'est comme les écoles d'art coûtent tellement cher, c'est tellement un investissement terrible en fait, c'est comme il y a des écoles qui te, qui te disent que tu n'as pas le droit de travailler pendant, euh, pendant ce temps-là, c'est irréaliste en fait, c'est irréaliste, je pense que même c'est limite traumatique en fait pour les parents qui doivent en fait financer ça. Moi, je suis endetté à 30 000 dollars et pas parce que l'école me coûte 30 000 dollars, parce que ça s'est multiplié par trois pour moi. Donc, c'est euh, non, c'est terrible, c'est terrible. Là, actuellement, je ne sais même pas en fait comment je vais, euh, je vais faire ça, mais c'est euh, ça. Je, je pense que c'est vraiment, euh, ça ne rejoint pas en fait l'investissement qu'on fait. C'est comme euh, les, les gens s'attendent qu'on euh, qu ait constamment une aise euh, horaire et puis qu'on soit en, totalement en capacité de ne pas travailler à côté alors que c'est irréaliste. Il faut travailler parce que sinon, tu ne la gagnes pas ta vie. Ou alors, il faut rendre les écoles moins chères, je ne sais pas. Mais là, actuellement, en fait, c'est clairement... Euh, ça, ça, ça classe beaucoup, en fait, les arts. Je ne pense pas qu'on peut dire que les arts sont un domaine accessible... Euh, à des classes sociales plus pauvres ou même, ou même plus euh, moyennes là c'est super difficile d'y avoir accès même si on a de plus en plus de ressources je pense que oui mais, euh, mais je pense qu'il y a encore énormément de chemin à faire tu touches à quelque chose de super intéressant Brice qui était un peu sous tout ce qui était mentionné mais c'est vraiment la question, la question de l'argent puis à quel point comme, comme artiste c'est quelque chose dont on doit se préoccuper mais en même temps qui est, pas, qui est rarement nommé il y a peut-être un, une sorte de, de tabou là-dedans puis tu sais je pense aussi qu'un angle mort qu'il y a quand on dit que les artistes doivent se créer leurs propres opportunités c'est la question que le temps le temps c'est de l'argent le temps c'est une source de capital comme moi, la, je sais que la raison qui m'a permis d'écrire une première pièce, c'était d'avoir le temps de le faire, le temps de me mettre dans cet espace-là pour le faire. Et moi, j'ai eu la chance d'avoir tu sais, comme du soutien financier, justement, de, ma part de, de la part de ma famille. Et là, ça, ça crée l'espace pour justement travailler gratuitement, pour mettre les balises, les pierres d'assises, pour dire, OK, d'accord, je travaille à être cette, cette, cette personne artistique-là que je veux être, mais comment est-ce que je mange en attendant aussi, tu sais, comment est-ce qu'on fait ça sans soutien, c'est un petit peu, euh, on entre dans une école, on se dit, vous avez tous été sélectionnés, donc vous avez tous le même talent, mais pas tout le monde a les mêmes ressources après pour le mettre en application, puis ça, je pense que c'est peut-être aussi un, un angle mort euh, des, des écoles, des formations. Mm. Oh, go ahead, Julie. I think the, like, glorifying... Uh what did you say glorifying burnout thing really like struck a nerve for me because I feel like it just hits on like all the problems of like exploitation and capitalism in theater um and just like the idea that like as artists like what we're expected to do or like what we're trying to do I think is like um 
it's like embodiment. Like we're, we're trying to bring ourselves like fully into like the stage or the writing or like whatever like work it is that we're doing. It's like, how are we meant to do that when we're stretched, like when we're expected to, I guess, like stretch ourselves so thin that like we can't fully be present. We can't fully like do what it, or like try to express like what it is that we're trying to like fully um, express. Um, like I was told um, during the uh, process of like writing my like show with school, like I was like, I, I can't be in the room for a full like eight hours every day and still be expected to go home and like make rewrites. Like that's just not possible. That is like, I, like I, I need to sleep. Like I'm, I'm, I still have like needs as a human that I need to be able to fulfill, to be able to like do that work. And when you're, and what I was sort of like told was like, oh, well that's just part of the work. And I'm just like, is it? <laughs> Cause I think if that's just like how it is and that's how like we think it, like it's it, yeah. If that's like what it is, it's just like, shouldn't that be different? you know like shouldn't isn't it important that like our needs as like human humans are like met in the room so that we can sort of like do our best work as and it shouldn't just be like doing our best work that but that's just how it's framed because it's everything is about the work um like I think it should be more about like bringing our more like authentic like expression um, to the space. Um, yeah, but everything is framed in terms of like work and money and, and uh, productions and things needing to go out on a schedule and timeline. And I just, I just don't know. It's, it's bringing up a lot for me <laughs> in terms of, um, and I think the pandemic in general has sort of like brought up all these like questions that we have about like how we work and how capitalism affects our lives and how we're all sort of like dying <laughs> under all of it, not to be like <laughs> nihilistic or like doomsday, but like mm, that's that's just what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I think it also starts like a really toxic it just it starts a lot of really toxic patterns in yourself like especially if you're very passionate and motivated and a lot like a lot of time when you're getting out of school that's the sort of feeling you're you you have and that's a lot of the feeling that you're fed to is this con these constant meetings of like people really want to see you and they want to see your work and I'm happy that people were feeding me that because the opposite is not necessarily great, but it also, it just, it, it, it meant to me that if I continue to work in this way, eventually there will be an outcome. And instead, there was an industry that actually doesn't support emerging artists and, and also, I think, wanted to get back and retain some of the work that they lost. A lot of experienced actors lost a lot of work. And so I understand they want to rehire people. They want to get back work that was lost. But instead of going out into the world, working really hard, feeling like I was getting stuff in, in reciprocation, I was just burning myself out mentally and physically and on top of that police is right like you have to make money and because you don't have any of that experience while you're at school then when you get out you're like oh I actually like really need to make money now because I just spent three years of not making any money and then on top of that you're trying to maintain this emerging artist putting out feelers for opportunities thing and so you just have no rest and your whole day is full of work. It doesn't end like once you go home from your restaurant job. Um, even if you have an agent who's supposedly putting you out for things, again, like all the opportunities I've been afforded have been through connections, have been through me emailing people, seeing something, applying for it. And it's constant. And I think it got to a point where 
my mom actually was like, you're spending a hundred percent of your day and your life right now on your career. And actually as a person, your career is only supposed to take up a certain amount of your life in order to have a fulfilling life. And that's the really hard thing to navigate in the arts. Is it something that's pa- that you're passionate about? But how do you actually just like live a little bit? And like, as far as saying, take some time off and, 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 and heal from the burnout that you've experienced three years in a row. Like that was really, really hard for me to do, really hard to let myself do. And I think I still like am getting used to it, just being like, calm down. You don't, you can take a day off and you can go for a walk. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. And I love how you put it back in context of having just graduated and the sort of drive that we tend to feel to like get stuff done and put ourselves out there immediately after graduating. Um, For me, I know it was, it was difficult for me to realize that like, oh, I actually did just spend three years studying this thing. And I, deserve to be taken seriously and to take myself seriously and I don't have to earn that I don't have to earn those those breaks and those moments of like putting myself first that should already just be there um and that was of course like exacerbated by graduating during a pandemic where nothing was happening and I was like should I be taking a break right now I don't feel like I've earned it but like Mm -hmm. people don't have to earn that that's you know people shouldn't have to earn that um yeah Mm-hmm. you guys brought up some oh julie please go ahead just like a lot of the work that anna you're talking about like is unpaid like it's it's late but it is like still labor and just because it's like unpaid labor doesn't mean that it's not like just des- like deserving of any like break or acknowledgement or like compensation <laughs> Um, and I, and it does feel like a structural sort of like, uh, like systemic issue. Um, and it's, it is like actually just using people's like passion for arts and like, like being told that you're so lucky to be doing the thing that you want to be doing, uh, that is ripe, uh, for, uh, institutions to exploit, um, that unpaid labor uh, to like tell you that or, or to like get you to keep doing the thing. Yeah. We have like so much uh, in the arts community, we are so indebted to each other that in a way that you, you don't find in other places. And so even in the context of the pandemic, in terms of actual COVID, like when you look at like roommates, for instance, who have school, yeah, they have to be careful about COVID, but they can still just, you know, maybe put on their mask if they have a little cough and blah, blah, blah. Like the, 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 the duty to one another is, is just the to- takes a totally different form in, in outside the arts community. And, and that has been hard because your actions undoubtedly affect everyone else part of your team or part of whatever you're trying to uh, commit to. And so that commitment was really daunting, like really daunting to know, we already know we're a team, but like to know that like medically we could, we could cause risk or harm it. Like I, I, we had never had I didn't know my actual art could be dangerous and 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 this time using my mouth to to say words was dangerous like actually dangerous because someone could breathe in my air and die like you know like that's how that, like that's what my my brain is doing and I think that's just like one aspect yeah that's covid but 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 That's kind of how everything is working in our community and everybody, and and when you get a room full of these passionate people all feeling indebted to each other, working for an institution or a higher body, like what you get is what Julia was talking about, some of that exploitation, because we want so badly to make it work. And we want so badly 
to do something. We don't know. Some people want to be on stage because they like being under the lights. Some people want to tell a story. Some people can't stop the words from coming out of their mouth. Some people, you know what I mean? Like there's so many different kinds of us that make up this thing. And sometimes it's really selfless. Sometimes it's really individual. Sometimes it's, and so like, to think there's all these people passionate about something, but we can be so easily swayed by these higher bodies, like is really heartbreaking because it's like when you get to talking with any artist, we all start to come to this place. What we're talking about now, we all start to realize we love something, but we're all fighting against something. And we're all frustrated at the same quotes from an, um, like a, a person with more experience in the community who's telling us how hard it's going to be, who's telling us, and, and then you feel like a brat, you feel like a bratty, ungrateful, little, like unexperienced, just blundering toddler, just being like, no, it's not going to be like that with my generation. But like, I actually feel like it's not going to be like that because we are actually talking about these things and these panels and things like this happen. And, 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 and just hearing you all talk, like I get very inspired no, I, I, I love knowing, Jake, that you have worked and lived in Montreal for so long when everyone in the world is trying to get me to leave and like, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and Julia, you've made such a, like, a, well, trans-provincial leaps in your work, which is like crazy. And, and uh, yeah, I, it's such a balance between being slapped in the face and then like inspired over and over again. And that like, it's really I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying, but I just, yeah, there's a dichotomy between the love of this thing and like the world we live in. And I don't think we'll never, I don't think we'll ever not be fighting against that, but it's kind of like magical. Inspired is like the name of our collective autobiography. Pardon? It's like the slapped in the face and inspired is like our collective autobiography. Yeah, yeah. The panel should be slapped in the face and (laughs) inspired an emerging artist story. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but I don't know I was just like rambling a bit but yeah I love hearing you guys talk about this because I remember that I'm not alone in this and uh yeah man thank you as like god I a lot of what you guys have been saying about like productivity culture just kind of the glorification of burnout as well as that constant tug of loving and also despising the industry you're trying to get your damn foot in the door for is so real because I feel that so many people don't real who aren't working in the arts don't understand that work doesn't start when pen hits paper. It doesn't start when you walk into a rehearsal room. It is constantly going on. Um, Virginie and I are in a a musical theater writing workshop. Um, She's an amazing, amazing lyricist and book writer. And we were talking about how even just thinking about work, it's ever present in the arts. I'm always, I notice that I always have a notebook around and I always feel like I'm in a work headspace. And that is so exhausting because you never feel like you're actually kind of checking out of of that um, mind mind frame at any time. And, And the fact that one, it's already low paid. And when you're an emerging artist, you're kind of being expected to maybe receive an honorarium, even nothing for some of the opportunities that you take up on because, you know, exposure is like the trade-off you're going to get, or maybe like a mentorship is going to be kind of the, the reward you receive for the time and effort that you put into something. It just makes it so difficult to climb out of this like hole that keeps on being dug further and further. Um, so I, I feel kind of that exhaustion, albeit probably not to the same extent that you guys have had, um, but my God, it, like, as well, everything you said, I think has really rung true with everyone here. Um, to, to go for a slightly more positive question, <laughs> um, during the pandemic, have you guys been able to at all explore a certain creative avenue that you weren't able to do before so that you feel has been like a very authentic, and rewarding experience for you to really delve into? Uh, yeah, actually, I did uh, quite a lot of... Uh, oh, I, uh, je vais switch en français <laughs> pour la diversité. Uh, <laughs> Any language you want. <laughs> uh, uh, On adore um, le bilinguisme. 
c'est ta pitié. <rire> euh, J'ai fait beaucoup d'ateliers euh, euh, depuis ma graduation. Euh, en fait, en sortant de l'école, j'avais le sentiment qu'il y avait beaucoup de choses qui me manquaient et ça commençait à, à, à devenir de plus en plus clair suite à un atelier de jeu caméra. Je me rendais compte que clairement, je ne sais pas jouer devant la caméra et c'est pourtant les opportunités qui vont m'être le plus souvent présentées, euh, que ce soit en pub ou en cinéma ou en série télé. Donc, pour moi, ça me paraissait nécessaire. Donc, j'ai commencé par ça. J'ai fait les ateliers chez Louis Oliva, chez Jean-Pierre Bergeron, puis dernièrement chez Daniel Fichot. Et honnêtement, ça m'a énormément apporté. J'ai vraiment senti que je, demande, que je devenais un meilleur interprète à chaque fois. Puis euh, après, j'ai eu un peu une épiphanie qu'il était temps que je remarque aussi. C'était que ben, je suis français. Donc, quand tu es français, tu joues moins à la télé. Par contre, quand tu es français, tu as un petit avantage en voix. Euh, parce que ben, généralement, le, le normatif est un peu plus euh, accessible. Donc, j'ai fait un cours de doublage en voix de jeux vidéo. Et euh, ça a été... Une énorme, euh, un peu une révélation en fait. Je savais que j'aimais la voix, je, je, je savais que déjà tout petit, j'aimais euh, faire des voix de composition, tout ça. Puis là, ça a concrétisé beaucoup de choses et c'est clairement, euh, si je n'avais pas eu ce déclic-là, je pense que je serais passé à côté de plus d'opportunités en fait. Et là, je suis beaucoup moins inquiet. Euh, J'ai terminé mon cours hier, littéralement. Je suis beaucoup moins inquiet par rapport à mon avenir depuis que j'ai fait ce, ce cours-là en doublage et que je, je vois que c'est concret, en fait, et que ce n'est pas juste un, un rêve d'enfant de faire une voix de personnage dans un, dans un jeu vidéo. C'est quelque chose qui se fait. Et en l'occurrence, si jamais vous avez l'occasion, je vous le suggère à, à l'INIS. Maintenant, il y a des cours qui sont donnés par Pixel Audio. Et c'est une avenue qui s'ouvre de plus en plus. On va de plus en plus avoir besoin d'interprètes là-dessus parce que... Ben, des, des voix trafiquées par logiciel, ça marche de moins en moins. En fait, il faut des interprètes pour tout, pour les voix de monstres, comme pour les, comme pour les brouhaha en arrière, comme pour les, les interprètes principaux. Donc euh, voilà, ça a été pas mal le, la grosse révélation pour moi, en tout cas, et l'une de mes meilleures opportunités pendant, pendant, depuis ma, ma graduation. <coughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if I have anything that is specific to the pandemic. I think what we were saying earlier, like the pandemic slowed me down where I then ha like was forced to really be able to like explore these things. Otherwise, I probably would have, I could have seen myself like kind of, yeah, getting attached to something and then just going down that road. And then maybe years later being like, oh, is this? Do I like any of this? Am I just yielding myself to somebody else sort of like telling me what to do um, or telling me like this, you know, like not that like a life in soaps is bad or a life in like just Shakespearean theater is bad, but just things like the kind of limiting. Um, I think, again, creating with friends, especially people that I graduated with. And also doing things that sort of border theater and other things. Like I'm just really intrigued by like verbatim and theater as a form of like journalism, um, audio theater and the different media that can that can be used to tell stories. I think that's been really clear to me is that like the thing that I get most out of theater is telling a story. And when it can become as accessible as, as possible, that's when it feels the most genuine to me as well. Because story storytelling has always been ever present in like every single culture, every single community, all of the relationships that I have, So making that, translating a story into like a piece of art, I think is what I look forward to most exploring more and more. I, I spent a lot of the pandemic on Zoom, lots of workshops. I didn't even know about this world of workshops like until the pandemic happened and I'm like, oh, I, maybe I don't even want to be an actor. I don't know. Maybe I want to be a dramaturg. Like, maybe I want to, maybe I want to 
I don't, I, I, I think I'm really nerdy for the process. Like that sounds tacky. I know, but I just, I love rehearsal and like workshops are like my dream state. Like you don't have to perform it. You don't really have to learn any lines. You don't really have to like, it's so funny. And, and you just get to go and like give your ideas and, and sometimes they like them and sometimes they don't. And, and, and like maybe one day when that plays out, like there's like a line in there because you said some stupid thing in rehearsal one day and they actually put it in the play and it's like, that's like history, that's amazing. And so um, I would encourage anyone who like, has a penchant for words or or just uh, talking um, to try and get into some workshop rooms because there's something really beautiful about the stage after it leaves one person's mind or pen and before the rest of the world meets it. It's like so magic. I had no idea that there was such a importance placed on that. And I don't even think I would have been as involved in them if it wasn't as if we hadn't switched to this uh, Zoom medium. So yeah, I'm a big fan of workshops. I would just like go watch people workshopping a play I wasn't even in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I okay, sorry. Go for it. <laughs> Wait, oh, okay. Uh, I started my job during the pandemic. So I was hired to do communications for T. Sridhanya uh, Theater Company uh, because of some shifting around in the company. I am now also doing like admin stuff, like contracts and shit. And like, it's all, I don't, like joining to do comms and to do like visual design sort of reminded me of like how much I love drawing and like and visual art and like I redesigned their website and sort of like rebranded like did some rebranding like around um around that trying to give it a bit of like a fresher like appeal to young people in Montreal um and it just like that's been really nice like just actually like drawing doing poster design and I think it's why like the the puppetry thing is really exciting to me because it's like actually like designing and building like puppets um, is is really exciting to me uh, but also like trying to manage two jobs right now I'm like sometimes it's it it can be like like teetering between oh I'm getting everything done I'm a bad bitch I like I got this to like what the fuck is going on <laughs> I feel like I dropped the ball on like everything and it's always like in between like those two things and it's like a bit difficult like during the pandemic because everyone is like working from home and everyone like we we don't really feel like connected to each other and like able to sort of ask for help um because on the operation side it, it, on the operation side like we're very like bare bones right now um but it's 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 doable. It's like happening, and I think like had this not been um, remote work that I've been doing like since I think I started this job June May or June of uh, 2021 that like this this all I learned a lot, um, and it wouldn't have been possible if this was not remote because um, school doesn't allow for jobs. But like I I'm. I'm working, like, you know. Uh, I, I started teaching uh, children's theater, which is something that I knew I wanted to do even before uh, the pandemic and all that, because I love kids and I'm really passionate about arts education and I wanted to pay forward sort of what I had gotten when I was younger. Um, so now I do that, like that's how I make most of my income. And weirdly enough, it's like stretched me a bunch as an, like I used to think of myself really purely as an actor, but now with these kids, I'm having to like devise and direct and like write for them. And it's made me realize that I can actually do all this stuff. Um, and it's also been like a really lovely way to like get back in touch with, to be less precious and remember like, hey, we're all just playing. We're all just having a good time. We're all just using our imaginations. Like, like the stuff that I tell to my kids when we're in class is like stuff that I then go and tell myself as I walk to the rehearsal. Like it's, it's, um, that's been like a really lovely surprise for, for, 
the pandemic for me. All of you are saying such fun and inspiring things. I'm just like, it does like give us hope and remind us that like, I'm I'm trying I'm starting to dislike the word opportunity, but that stuff is happening and stuff is alive and like people are are moving and what you just said, Jake, about like talking to kids and then we should talk to ourselves with just as much care as we talk to like a child. We're just as deserving as of, of that. It's really great. And I kind of want to bounce off something that the way you were uh, espoir describing workshops and that whole feeling of like, you mean I don't have to perform? You mean I can just like just like give and share and experience like I want us to have kind of like a positive collective brainstorm right now and just think of like pretend that time and money and all of the various very like legitimate complaints we've listed so far pretend that all of these could go away like what is like a, a passion project or like um, a type of resource or like institution Um, or uh, opportunity that you'd like to see um, be created in the in the next few years. If really like we all had like a magic wand and anything was possible. Take a shot every time we say opportunity. Ah. That when you start disliking a word, it's like the only thing that pops up in your mind. So that's I just cursed myself. Guilty. I would like to see. Uh, a new Canadian federal theater project. I would like money in artists' pockets. Uh, and I would like to get rid of the regional theater system we have right now, because I think it sucks. I think it's the worst. Uh, and I would like to create a system centered around artists where art becomes separate from capitalism. And we can make art that doesn't depend on the pockets of the one social class that will pay for it. I would like to expand our audience in that way. Uh, so Justin Trudeau, if that's interesting to you, my email is jcohen. No. Um, yeah, just piggybacking off of that, I would like every single show to be affordable for every person. And I would like most for people of all demographics and all like social classes and all different communities to go to the theater and have it be a normalized way of, uh, of catharsis, a normalized like outing that you're excited to do because you're able and because you feel drawn to the theater that is being put on, you know, like not getting people $5 tickets to go see a Shakespeare show, getting people for free into a new work. Like that is, yeah, and, and, and more new work, more new work put on by by big theater companies that have grandfather clauses that can pay people during illness stuff like that but also personally um uh, if i would love to be able to go with like me and um three other friends that i'm thinking of right now love to like go to a cabin in the woods and get a person who is well-versed in mycology to give us like a week of mushroom mycology sort of like experience and experimentation. And then I would like for us to go and write about it. Um, And then I would like to be able to start writing a script and then workshop the script. That would be great. Um, because there's a project that we're interested in that involves mushrooms. And I just think that that would be an incredible experience. <laughs> um, I, th I think I need a new definition of like, what we love, what live theater is and like what audience and performer is. And I'm not saying that everything should be immersive, but I think we've lost a lot of um, like conversation between, between everything, between the audience and the lighting designer. And the like, we've just like, we've lost communication between all the access points of theater and, and I, I really think that theater can be accessible 
to everyone. And I don't necessarily mean separating groups based on their accessibility needs. I think that's kind of where we are at right now is like, oh, there's some people who can't, so we'll just make a little thing for them on Saturday morning and like, you know, and I don't think that because that's not really what our ancestors were doing when they were telling stories and that's not really, there is, and theater can be everywhere in the world and I don't want this sense of intimidation. Everyone feels it like theater is this old, it's this money thing like, 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 just patrons pouring millions of dollars and, and wealthy grandmothers die and give their whole estate to the theater because that's where they're, someone took them, you know? And, and it's just like, it's just like, why are we waiting for these little miracles to sustain something that the world needs? And so I, I feel like there's a way to make it accessible and there's a, and, and by that, I don't even know what I mean, but it's like, it's almost like, you should be able to just leave your house and be in it. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know what that means, but it, it, it shouldn't be this thing where you have to book a ticket and then get on a bus and drive three kilometers and uh, 30 kilometers. And you know what I mean? It, it, it's just gotta be like limitless. It's, it's really gotta be what everyone believes it to be. And, 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 and it's really gotta exist in every nook and cranny possible. And like, like, why is it that certain demographics, like, why is it that like the highest demographic of people dropping out of theater schools are people of color? Or why, why are people like, why is it that is because this whole system is, is just messed up. Like, no matter how inclusive you try to be, certain students are gonna get more because of whatever reason. And certain students are gonna get less because of whatever reason, whether it is how they grew up, where they come from, what they have in their pocket, what like, and, and, and that just doesn't, it's just not working anymore. Like, it's just not how art was created. It's just not how it, that's just, I just feel so like we need, we need a, blank slate I want a blank slate <laughs> and then and then I want some really rad really I'm not a theater okay I think that some people we know what a theater kid looks like like we all know what the theater kid with their ukulele who doesn't go to parties and blah 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 like, we know what the theater kid looks like I know I'm being rude to that person if that's you but um you're still important in all of this, but there's some people who, there's some people that are like, why must so many professions be antithetical to theater? That needs to stop also. And, and why so many people think their, their metier can't be integrated into. My mom who would never, knew she was dropping me off at things, knew she was dropping me off at rehearsals, X, Y, Z, never knew that she could be part of some kind of theater thing until someone came and worked on her with translating our language into this like music scape. And like, it was just like, now you, do you see now mom's doing theater? Like, and it was that easy. And she might not even realize that she made theater, but someone else went away with our, our tongue and like our language in, in, in their ear and, and, and music and their heart. And like, they, that was such a little, like that was a five hours of my mom's day that, went into this thing that might be timeless, you know? So yeah, it's not linear and it's not, it's not money and it's not, it's, it's, it's like, it's really the people. So yeah, I said a lot, I know. <laughs> I'll pass it to the next person. Euh, ouais, en termes d'autres, euh, de ce que j'aimerais voir, par exemple, alors, <coughs> je vais encore faire mon maudit français, hein, euh, je préviens. Je, je, je crache beaucoup sur la France, c'est pas pour rien que j'ai immigré, je trouve que la France est en retard sur beaucoup de choses, je pense que la France est raciste et je pense que la France est en retard également sur la sexualité, sur la sentimentale, mais il y a trois choses que la France fait très bien, la bouffe, euh, le système de santé et 
très bien, ça se discute, mais l'intermittence. Je pense que l'intermittence, c'est quelque chose qui a beaucoup de failles en France, mais qui fonctionne clairement mieux qu'ici. Je ne pense pas que ce soit normal ici de dire constamment que hey, euh, le théâtre, c'est nécessaire, la culture est nécessaire, mais à côté de ça, tous les artistes doivent avoir une sideline. Tout le monde doit travailler. C'est quasiment pas envisageable d'être uniquement un artiste, sauf si tu as beaucoup de projets, si tu nages dans, dans les opportunités, justement, ben oui, ok, super, tu peux être un artiste, mais ce n'est euh, pas du tout une situation confortable. Et l'intermittence, en fait, permet de... Euh, si, alors, euh, les conditions, c'est, mettons, tu fais 506 heures, ne me demande pas pourquoi les 6, euh, de plus que 500, c'est comme ça, mais tu fais 506 heures et ça fait que pendant 3 ans, tu vas être subventionné par l'État et tu vas être comme... Tu n'auras pas nécessairement besoin de travailler pendant ce temps-là. C'est des moments où tu peux respirer et où tu vas avoir quand même un certain revenu. Tu vas pas... On ne va pas te laisser crever la gueule ouverte parce que tu n'es pas en train de créer ou parce que tu n'es pas en train de cumuler 36 projets et de faire un burn-out, justement. Et euh, je, je pense que ça, ça a quand même beaucoup de failles. Ça a beaucoup de failles telles que euh, des gens qui créent des, des faux projets et puis finalement, ben, c'est euh, de l'argent qui, euh, qui revient à des gens qui ne travaillent pas ou alors inversement, ben, des, euh, des gens qui nagent à mort dans les projets parce qu'eux, ben, euh, ils ressentent ce besoin de constamment travailler pour garder cette intermittence et garder un statut qui, qui va les, les laisser confortables. Mais je pense que c'est peut-être un peu plus souhaitable que la précarité assumée qu'on donne aux artistes. Et, ou alors, si ce n'est pas la précarité, clairement, ben, ça classe clairement les artistes dans le rang des riches. En fait, c'est les riches qui ont ce confort de pouvoir ne pas travailler et d'uniquement faire de l'art jusqu'à temps de, de recevoir en fait, ce, 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 ce traitement de faveur, puis cette diffusion, puis... Donc ouais, je, je pense que c'est actuellement c'est un système que je trouve très défaillant et que j'aimerais euh, j'aimerais voir arrangé pas à 100% exactement comme l'intermittence qu'on trouve en France évidemment mais je pense que il y a beaucoup de chemin à faire pour reconnaître les artistes et pas que qu'on considère que ce qu'ils font est facultatif c'est on ne paie pas des écoles entières pour faire des choses qui sont facultatives si on n'arrête pas de nous répéter qu'on est nécessaire et qu'on et qu'il faut absolument qu'on soit euh, Enfin, pendant la pandémie, là, tout le monde était en train de nous aduler, de nous dire « Ah oh là là, vous êtes tellement nécessaire à la vie de tout le monde. » Puis finalement, bah, qu'est-ce qu'on a gagné de plus Est-ce que j'ai plus d'opportunités parce qu'on a réalisé que j'étais un artiste Pas moi, en tout cas. Donc, je ne je, je sais pas. Je pense qu'il y, y a beaucoup de choses à arranger. Euh, évidemment, je n'ai pas beaucoup d'options de, 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 à proposer. Je ne sais pas quel sacrifice il faudrait faire pour, pour le faire. Mais en tout cas... Je, je, je pense que c'était une chose qu'il fallait que j'articule. And just to, yeah, and just to make clear, because it's like a really key concept, and not a lot of people. Sometimes we don't know what we mean when we say intermittence, but I think I translated as like a, um, a source of. It's a source of income, right? It's a regular source of income that's provided by the government once you reach like, which is what you were saying. But it can be tricky in and of itself. But once you like reach a, an official stat status as an artist, and I do think that would be like. A whole game changer and I know in the francophone community in the midst of the pandemic when everybody had to stop working people were saying well that is like an actual essential avenue if artists are like as essential as society says then they need to be provided for when they're not working because when they're not working like you said Hannah we're always working in some capacity or other the tree planters do it the firefighters do it everybody does it when they're not working they're chilling on some money or i mean supporting their families and like their their their, their loved ones <laughs> yeah i think just quickly off of that like uh, that classic saying of uh well nobody's in it for the money and it's like thank god like no but we're not in this to make at least at this point in my life I'm not doing this to make money and the work that I create also does not reflect that I don't want the work that I create to reflect my will to, my need to make money because that's just honestly flat and boring and means meaningless to me so if money is something a tool of survival in you know being able to eat it's not that if i get, if i have a certain amount of money that where i can survive i'm not going to work i'm not going to create like that's not the thing that's driving me 
And so it would be nice just to be able to survive um, and have time to create. Yeah, I was gonna say universal basic income. Um, I mean, for artists, but also I think just like for everybody, <laughs> like it's just, um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard. <laughs> Life is hard. Um, you asked, you were like, what kind of like project would you do if you had unlimited money and we're all like, eat the rich. <laughs> No, just like legit, just pushing the the socialist agenda, please. Um, yeah, because it's. Um, I don't know. Like, I I think there is such a strong sense of like competition between artists because we're all fighting over the same like the same limited sort of like funding, um, pool. Um. Like I, uh, I've, I've mentioned the the grants that I've been like lucky enough to get. Like it, I've mostly been applying to like the OAC, but it's like the reports come out and you can see like who gets the money and how much they get, but also like how much like money there is. And it's just like, oh no, like that's, that's like you, you feel bad, but it's also like you need the money like as well. And it's just like, why isn't there just like more money that can be like given to people? Cause it's like, I like I don't think like um yes like when you're applying to like companies it it is like you're applying with your project and like they they will fit like choose the ones that like fit their mandate the most but it doesn't take away like the value or the uh the need for like the other projects that like don't get the funding and so like what we need to do is like find other ways to fund these projects you know um and like some of that could be helped if people could just get like a universal basic income to help them just like lit like while they're doing it. Um, yeah, and, and, and just more, more investment into the, the work that they're telling us that we need to do, like the, like the, the self-producing like shit that we're all like being pushed on that doesn't have money, but all the money is going to like the larger institutions doing the fucking like Shakespeare and, and like whatever, right? So it's, it's like being told like, that's where you need to go, but the money is elsewhere. And it's just like, so where, what do, what do we do? Well, I think that brings us to the end of our main questions, which just leaves you me with more questions, let's be honest. Um, and I mean, I'm glad that the funding system is not like the Hunger Games at least, but it really is like, I, I just think of it, it's almost like you're like throwing a bag of crumbs. It's like that lady in Home, um, Home Alone, Lost in New York, the pigeon lady. And she's just like, and like every artist looking for funding is like a pigeon trying to get a crumb. Anyway, that was a very long analogy that was completely pointless. Um, <laughs> so just to kind of finish this off because we've gone a little bit over time and um, you guys are all very busy people. Uh, let's just end on, what are some things that have inspired you or brought you joy lately? Let's say a movie that you saw or a TV show or a book that you read or podcast even that just kind of reminded you why you do what you do. Um, personally, I went and saw the movie Worst Person in the World three times in cinemas. And it just really affirmed for me why I love film and why I especially love international film. As a Norwegian, we never get our movies here. Um, and it was just very affirming to see a piece of art really resonate so much with people around the world that it was being shown in like small cinemas in, in Montreal. So personally, that's for me what I would choose. Um, we can just go around the circle, starting with Virginie and then with the rest of you guys. Yeah, um, I didn't know you were gonna pass a question to me. I so wasn't prepared. Um, yeah, I was thinking there's this really great podcast. I can't remember if it was you, Brice, who recommended to me or like a bunch of people. It's called Le Coeur Sur la Table. Um, that combined with like the um, the books of Liv Stromquist, which is she's like um, 
um, she does graphic novels, but she is both, both are like pieces that really explore like, I guess everything that went wrong with like patriarchy and like heterosexual relationships and just like how we kind of like lost the meaning of love we, within that. And I think they're done really in a way um, about sharing, uh, rediscovering true care without like um, that need we have to dominate each other all the time and control each other and how that can lead to like so much abuse and pain when you're just trying to love someone, right? Being in a relationship is just that. And sometimes it veers toxic. And those are two things that are just like, both the podcast called Le Coeur sur la Table and then Liv Strom's Quiz, all her books really. Um, yeah, those are things that are have been inspiring to me lately. I think everyone should read them, It'd be mandatory. And then we'd all be so much better at loving because wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> I'll what? send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Love Zoom. Um, you guys can also please like plug whatever show project workshop you have going on um in the you know upcoming weeks, the rest of this year even. Just plug to your heart's desire. All right, I'll plug just quickly before <laughs> I don't know if the host is supposed to, but uh I have a show coming up uh this fall. I can't say in which theater. But if you follow me, you'll know where. And it's about um, audio porn and care and teaching care to kids, all wrapped up in one weird, awesome little show I wrote. So keep your eyes and your ears open for that. I'll pass it on. I can't remember who I was passing it on to, but uh, Espoir, go ahead. What was the first um, question? Oh, what, I'm, what inspires me? Mm, I think every time I'm like on Instagram and I see a uh, like a like a poster, like a visual, maybe moving poster, and they have music on them for like events or raves or something like that. This isn't this is a concrete answer, but it's like you can tell that they there's an original song there and you can tell that someone designed the graphic. And then you can tell that they added in like pictures from last time's event. So there was a photographer involved and you can tell that, you know what I mean? It's just like, you can tell that all these people came in to do this thing for a DJ. And I'm like, that's amazing. And then also there's going to be a magazine launch. And then also someone's going to do a live sex art like fucking performance art thing and also we have an original cocktail at the back like what the heck? like that that's like so many people coming together to do something um i see a lot of collaboration in other arts communities that aren't necessarily the theater film and tv world that i think we could learn a lot from i think they put a lot of faith in the new guy in some of those communities and they put a lot of faith in, um, they just put a lot of trust in a lot of people really quickly. And I think uh, I just get inspired whenever I see many people of different, different uh, everything working together. And the other thing, oh, oh yeah, um, I am, Anna and I are in a podcast that is called The Rest is Electric, directed by Michael Wanless, and it was written by their sibling Nicola Wanless in Calgary, and it is a science fiction podcast, and it's like a radio play, so it's a story. You just dive right into a story, just watching TV with your eyes closed type, type vibes. It's very exciting, so we're about to record the season two. So if you want to check out the season one, if you haven't already, it's on Spotify and Apple Music and everything. It's called The Rest is Electric. And if you ever find yourself in Ontario, in Stratford uh, this year, um, I'm going to be performing in Death and the King's Horseman by Nigerian playwright Wole Shoyinka. Um, this is one of my favorite plays in the whole, whole world. And I'm so, so blessed that I get to go and just be a little girl in the village watching all these greats performing all these um, beautiful, beautiful passages of texts. And I get to collaborate with all these people. And it's like 
mostly a black cast and um which is kind of rare for for Stratford and um the director of the show Tewia is very adamant that we get everyone who needs to see this show to 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 see the show and he's trying to bring down as many barriers around that as possible and so if you're around and interested in seeing it we open in August and we go to October you can hit me up if it's hard for you to see the show maybe there's a way we can make it happen whatever so yeah death and the king's horseman and the rest is electric we pass it on to the next person <laughs> Um, I can go next. Kind uh, I'm, I've been really inspired. Yeah, just what as far as saying too, like seeing these groups of people come together, especially like in the queer community, and like the nightlife scene in the city is really, really vibrant. Like seeing a lot of the like trans community come together and create and. It becoming also really popular and being like, yeah, they're, they're carrying the weight of the Montreal party scene on, or it's just absolutely. like not just party, but just social scene on their backs and absolutely. thanklessly. So if you can donate to, if you see any GoFundMe's, yeah, for Cyana studio, uh, studio, anything like that, please go. They're making art accessible for so many people. Continue. Yeah, to. no, but exactly, and they're and it's like hiring so many other people, other young trans artists also in doing their, their work, which is really cool. Um, and on that same note, uh, I recently did something uh, last Friday that was part of Al Souterrain at Concordia. That was a performance that was like sort of a, um, it was a, a mockumentary style talk show about that's basically about like the melodrama of queer relationships and it was this like sort of uh love helpline and so obviously everyone was like acting it wasn't real but it, it just seeing the catharsis that it brought to the audience was really fun and it was a like I feel like there's some there's so many times when I'm thinking about an idea and I'm like okay then I go to what I'm going to say in the grant and how I'm going to make it seem like it's important and needed and the nice thing about this one was that there it wasn't at all serious it didn't take itself seriously at all and I just would love to see what the grant like I'm sure they had to kind of make it seem a lot more important or like important to uh granting bodies when they were getting funding for it but it still had a huge impact and people loved it. And I think that was really inspiring. That's like, does, sometimes you can create really fun stuff that doesn't have as much like, like it's a lot more, like it's, there's a lot more levity in it. And so that uh, I'll also plug as like, it's, I think, uh, cause it was live, but it was also filmed. And that's by, uh, the artist Alex uh, Rocks is their, is their stage name. Um, so that I think will be coming out soon and it'll be like really fun, mockumentary, goofy, melodramatic uh, talk show. Um, and then on top of that, yeah, the, the, the podcast that Aspar and I are filming or recording the second season for is very exciting to me. And I'll pass it on to Jake because I know he's got a show. Yeah, uh, I, I'm gonna, well, first. I'm going to give the same answer two times, which is uh, my like my classes and my kids have been very inspiring to me. Like it's the springtime, so they all have their shows. Um, like this week, I have a class of kids that's doing Little Shop of Horrors, and they're so excited about it. And I'm just like, yeah none of you guys are ever gonna like, you guys are all gonna go off and study other stuff and it doesn't matter. Like you're just doing this because you love theater and you love storytelling. And I'm like, especially after, you know, something like this where I'm like thinking really hard about like the industry and our place in it and how we can make things better. It's nice to, to just be like, y'all wanna sing and have a good time? Yeah, like let's do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I have a show um, opening in about a week and a half at Monument National. It's um, Next to Normal with Contact Theater. Uh, it's like literally my favorite musical of all time. I, I'm, it's this amazing like rock musical about a family where the mother is uh, bipolar depressive and it, it's about how mental health impacts the people in, in a family and in a community. So I'm super excited about that. 
Uh, that's on May 6th at Mismal Nacional. And I guess I'll pass it to Julie. Um, so something that I've been really excited for and I think has been really inspiring for me is Vince Staples' new album just came out. Um, and I think like, I think I've been thinking a lot about like in my isolation, just like the, the theme of like home and like what home um, is um, that I think he explores uh, really well in the album and also just like in listening to it too. Like I, I feel like he's um, grown a lot as an artist since I like first uh, like heard him and like is reaching like a level of um, self-awareness and like clarity um, in his vision and his voice that I can only aspire to <laughs> at this point. Um, it's a really good album, please check it out. Um, and I uh, have a reading coming up for my solo show that I've been developing with buddies um, uh, in Bad Times Theater uh, that is hosted, um, that is going to be hosted by uh, T Street Anya Theater with Festival SSSE. Uh, that will be on uh, May 13th at 8 p.m. Uh, please come. I need people <laughs> to show up for this and like events are happening live again. So please, please, please come. Uh, and that I think it's my show the first night, May 13th and May 14th will be a reading of Marjorie Chan's Lady Sunrise, uh, which is also a really great show. It premiered at Factory uh, last year in Toronto. And I was really trying to push people to, not last year, oh God, like during the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, like three three years ago, three, two? Well, it, it happened, I, I saw it in Toronto and then came yeah. back and then COVID started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, shit, fuck. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, whatever, <laughs> like, whatever. I'm sorry, I'm cursing, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's been a long, but um, it's, um for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch in toronto it's coming it's being read on stage one night only uh with festival ssz may 14th may 13th is my solo show it it's supposed to have pole dancing in it but like we we are just doing the reading of it um and that's fine it's still in development but like come check it out come see where it's at it's about my relationship with my family as most of my things not all of my things are but like yeah the, the trauma um, <laughs> okay <laughs> all right uh <laughs> alors de mon côté je 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 sais pas quoi ajouter <laughs> um oui uh, les les trucs qui m'ont inspiré uh en, euh, alors, j'ai mille choses qui m'inspirent, euh, donc c'est difficile de faire un choix. Mais dans ces moments-là, quand on me pose une question aussi générale, j'aime parler des choses un peu plus nichées. Donc, je vais faire mon gros geek et mon gros nerd et mon gros weeb et je vais vous parler de jeux vidéo et de manga. Et donc, je vais vous parler de What Remains of Edith Finch. Euh, c'est un, un jeu vraiment très poétique euh, qui se fait en 1h30, 2h environ. C'est vraiment la durée d'un film qui euh, raconte l'histoire d'Edith Finch, qui euh, revient dans sa maison d'enfance et qui la réexplore, en fait, puisqu'elle a, elle a à peine grandi dedans. Ensuite, elle, elle a vécu ailleurs. Et grosso modo, ce la seule chose qu'elle sait de, ses familles, de sa famille, c'est que euh, il, tout le monde est mort prématurément. Et il y a comme une espèce de malédiction qui, qui, euh, qui tourne un peu autour de ça. C'est un jeu vraiment très poétique, vraiment très touchant, qui parle de deuil, de famille, de nostalgie, de passage à l'âge adulte. Et c'est vraiment très, très, très touchant, au même titre qu'un deuxième jeu que je trouve excellent et qui, je pense qu'il peut tourner à peu près sur n'importe quelle machine. Ça s'appelle Before Your Eyes. Et c'est un jeu qui se base sur le, la webcam et le clignement d'yeux, en fait. Euh, à chaque fois qu'on cligne des yeux, le jeu avance. Et on suit le parcours de vie d'un enfant jusqu'à sa mort. Et euh, c'est hyper, hyper touchant. C'est des jeux qui m'inspirent énormément parce que je pense que mon écriture est très basée... En fait, euh, c'est un peu Virginie qui m'a fait réaliser ça, mais mon écriture se base beaucoup sur le passé, la nostalgie. 
Et euh, c'est des thèmes qui sont peut-être un peu bateaux, mais qui m'inspirent beaucoup, en fait. Et euh, donc, voilà, ces deux jeux en particulier. Et euh, également, un manga qui m'a touché, auquel je pense encore énormément aujourd'hui et qui, euh, qui, me, qui adapte beaucoup mon écriture, c'est Oyasumi Pum Pum ou euh, Bonne Nuit Pum Pum ou Good Night Pum Pum. C'est l'histoire d'un enfant euh, qui est représenté sous la forme d'un oiseau en cartoon. Euh, le reste du graphisme est très réaliste, en fait. C'est comme vous et moi, quoi. Et euh, en gros, c'est sa vie. Et c'est difficile un petit peu de, de résumer ça, mais je dirais que c'est... Euh, c'est uh, A Coming of Age Story. C'est uh, une histoire qui parle de dépression, de, de famille, de, oui, de passage à l'âge adulte. On le voit d'abord quand il est enfant, vers 8 ans, je crois. Et puis, on finit l'histoire quand il est au, au début de sa vingtaine. Et c'est uh, extrêmement touchant. C'est beaucoup de, de réflexions sans, sans vraiment de tabou, en fait. Je veux dire, ça parle de sujets très, uh, très touchants en rapport à l'enfance, mais également de sujets très, très adultes, en fait, comme la dépression ou la sexualité. Je pense qu'on met beaucoup de tabous sur la sexualité quand on est enfant, en fait, alors que ça reste un moment où on le découvre aussi. Et euh, ouais, je, je, c'est quelque chose qui m'a énormément, énormément touché. Euh, j y, j y, je, je pense que je le comparais à Stand By Me, par exemple, euh, dans la maturité, euh, tout en étant dans l'enfance, en fait. C'est très, très touchant. Euh, pour ce qui est des, des projets dans, que je pluggerai, Grosso modo, là, le mois prochain, je vais avoir deux tournages qui vont être des tournages euh, indépendants. Le premier s'appelle « Ce qui vous effraie euh, », qui va être réalisé par Maxime Campodubuc. C'est euh, un policier où je vais incarner un détective qui, euh, qui va en gros s'entretenir avec euh, un personnage qui est un peu mystérieux, qui est comme un genre de psychic. Le twist, c'est que ce psychic-là est comme euh, se nourrit un peu de la souffrance des gens. J'en dis pas plus, j'ai pas envie de trop spoiler. Personnellement, j'ai été vraiment bluffé par le scénario quand je l'ai lu. Et le second, c'est Amistad, euh, écrit et qui va être réalisé par euh, Alexander Di Staolo et Sol Delgado. Euh, un duo de, de réalisateurs et, et de scénaristes qui, qui ont très bien écrit leur histoire. C'est une histoire d'amitié, euh, trois amis d'enfance qui se retrouvent dans un cottage pour euh, rattraper le temps perdu et on comprend qu'il y a toujours eu des tensions entre eux. Et un quatrième personnage va arriver. Je ne préfère pas en dire trop, mais grosso modo, ce quatrième personnage-là va être un petit peu à l'origine du, du ressoudement entre ces, ces trois autres-là. C'est euh, voilà, typiquement des thèmes qui m'inspirent beaucoup. Euh, et euh, plus personnellement, je, suis, je disais que, que j'étais également en phase d'écriture plutôt d'un balado. Le balado s'appelle Ligne. Et euh, donc, j'approche un petit peu de la fin de l'écriture. Euh, Ligne, ça va être un, un podcast sous forme d'anthologie. Euh, en fait, chaque épisode va raconter une histoire un peu d'horreur euh, dont tout s'articule via des médias euh, audio. En fait, ça peut être des échanges téléphoniques, euh, des, euh, un enregistrement d'émissions radio, euh, un enregistrement d'entretien euh, dans, dans un interrogatoire. Et concrètement, c'est ça. C'est que des, euh, des, de l'horreur qui se plug un petit peu dans quelque chose de réaliste. J'aime bien en fait quand le fantastique est juste légèrement suggéré et pas que ce soit juste paf dans ta face. Mais euh, voilà, c'est pas mal ça, je pense. C'est déjà pas mal, je crois. <rire> oui, merci. Yay. Those were all great ones. Yeah. Like I haven't heard of a lot of the little you know, recommendations or also I love the amount of people who've like dove into podcasting recently as a way of like kind of approaching digital theater. Um, it's such a cool avenue to kind of explore in also like while still kind of doing, relying on, I mean, you can do it from any distance, like it's just so approachable and it's so much easier to kind of collaborate with people. Um, anyway, thank you guys so much for joining today's conversation. I know we've definitely gone over time, but that's because you guys have had so many great things to say. Like so many things that I didn't even think about came up that I'm going to be like probably disassociating and staring at my wall while like really thinking of later today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys all have a great afternoon and uh, I'm excited for people to tune in to see this later today. All right. Yeah. Merci tout le monde. All right. Have, have a great rest of day.
and good luck with all your projects. I will be coming to all the ones in Montreal for sure. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Thank you.